All right. Hi, everyone. I'm Adrian Palmer, Editor-in-Chief of DTF Printing. Welcome to the Direct-to-Sales Proven Strategies to Drive DTF Printing Growth webinar. Today's webinar will provide ways for DTF printers to create an outbound sales strategy. Today's topics will include hiring a salesperson, developing sales strategies, marketing tactics, sales commission, building a more predictable revenue stream, and available technology and automation tools. I'm here with Kevin Baumgart, president of Sales Inc. Hey, Kevin. Hello. Hello. Good to be here. Yes. Uh, can you share a little bit about Sales Inc. and your background to our audience? Yeah, happy to. So I've spent my my entire career, almost 25 years, it pains me to say that, uh, focusing and helping companies grow sales. Uh, I spent a lot of my career in software and technology, and in a roundabout way, found myself in this crazy industry of apparel decorators. So over the last seven years, I've worked with hundreds of apparel decorators, small sub-million in revenue and incredibly large as well, kind of runs the gamut. Um, and my my sole focus has been helping them drive and imp improve sales, drive more revenue back to the shop, more profitable growth back to the shop. Uh, and so I started a, a coaching and consulting company called Sales Inc. Um, I do a lot of one-on-one -on -one coaching and consulting. I run a, an academy, which we'll talk about a little bit later. We've got a giveaway there. And then I also run some sales membership groups for the industry. So I'm, uh, I'm excited to be here to chat all things sales with y'all. Perfect. And we are happy to have you officially in the apparel industry, helping uh, apparel decorators and of course now DTF printers uh, in the sales area of their business. Um, yes, as you mentioned, we will be announcing the winner of the Sales Inc. Academy subscription, which is valued at $2,500 at the very end of the webinar. So make sure you stick around for that. Um, just some housekeeping notes. Um, we will also have a live Q&A session at the end of the webinar. So if you sent a question ahead of time and we didn't already answer that um, here in the webinar, we'll get those questions answered first. And if you have questions throughout, you can use the Q&A function um, or even the chat function. Let's get to it. All right. Outbound sales versus inbound sales. Kevin, what are the key benefits of creating an outbound sales strategy versus relying on what many printers are used to, word of mouth and inbound sales? Yeah. Um, what, what I love about shops that have put structure and focus around outbound is that they don't have to rely on word of mouth and inbound. Um, when we look at revenue that's coming in and opportunities that we're closing and, and new deals, we can now make it more predictable. So if we are going outbound, we can fill the funnel with new opportunities. We can quote new jobs. We can work with people that we hadn't worked with before. If we're focusing solely on letting the phone ring or letting the email inquiry or the quote form get filled out, we're relying on that. We don't have a lot of ownership and focus on net new opportunities. So I, I think the benefit is just peace of mind for the owners that that we have a predictable strategy to now go out and drive more revenue. It's not just waiting. Um, the challenging part is this is tough though. So going out, finding new business and really focusing on this is not the easy part. So there's there's hard work that goes into it, but there's obviously a lot of benefits of creating that that outbound funnel that most most shops don't have today. Right. And that kind of leads me to my next question, just misconception of in-house sales and, and what are some of those common miscon misconceptions? But also before that, maybe even just explaining the difference between outbound and inbound sales. Sure, sure. So when I think about inbound, I think about anyone raising their hand and saying that they want a quote, they want more information from us. They want details on, uh, on what we can do, how we can help them, how, what we can provide. So this would be current customers doing reorders. This could be people that got referred from someone, word of mouth, that are reaching out to us. I would consider all of that inbound. Uh, from an outbound perspective, that is us going outbound and trying to pull them into our sales process, pull them into our sales funnel. Um, that would be cold emailing, cold calling, dropping stuff off. Any strategy to try to go win a customer that's currently using another printer today. That, that's what I would consider outbound. Um, and so your, your question, uh, misconceptions around bringing sales in-house. Yeah. And even just myths that, you know, 
people may consider when they're trying to decide whether this makes sense. Um, is it crazy expensive? Does it take a lot of time? Sure, sure. So if someone is going to now bring sales in house and maybe, maybe we should say like, start going outbound, like mm -hmm. owning sales and going outbound. Um, I think there might be a misconception about, yeah, let's just do it. Like, it can't be that hard. Like, let's just make a couple calls and let's, let's put some kits together and drop them off, uh, b better than nothing. But I think there is a misconception that we can just try it. I think there needs to be focus on it. There needs to be investment on it. This is going to take some time and structure. There needs to be like most parts of our business, like a structured SOP and a strategy that we go and approach to go drive and win, win new business. Um, I think there's a misconception often that we have salespeople within our walls that they can just do outbound selling. And those salespeople are really inbound order takers, their account managers, their customer success folks. Um, I've seen way too many shops crash and burn on trying to go outbound sales because they have their account managers or their customer success folks go do it because they don't like to do it and it's not fun and they're not good at it. Um, so I think a common misconception is like, yeah, we'll just have our current team do it. So um, you, you kind of got to have that person to go do it. One last one that I'll mention, often uh, it's either, it could be one or the other. It can be the shop uh, saying that, all right, we need to hire a salesperson. There's no way that we can go sell unless a salesperson is there, but maybe it's the owner that has to go out and try it and build the structure and build the system and then go hire and bring on and do it once they understand it. But I also have seen the other way work well, where the owner who's pulled in a million different directions, it's tough for them to carve out time to actually do it. So the only way that that really works is to hire a salesperson and, and shop owners, you, you all are going to have to figure out what that right approach is, but I, I don't, I don't think there's a right or wrong. Um, but if you're going to do it, you got to put time and effort against it. Sure. What would you say to someone who says word of mouth works for me, you know, word of mouth has always worked for me and it's going to keep working for me. And I don't need this. G great. Great. Like all good. If you're continuing to grow and you're happy with the level of revenue that you're at, all, all good. Like going outbound is hard. Building a sales strategy is not easy. Um, what I what I would be concerned about though is like, are you okay if the revenue that you're at and then net income profitability that your your business is driving goes down a little bit because you have no ownership of that. It you're relying solely on your customers and word of mouth and the referrals that you're getting. Um, most business owners aren't good and with staying stagnant or aren't good at the uh, speculation of maybe decreasing in revenue. Um, I would say put, put time and effort and focus on it and try to go, try to do it, try to go outbound. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. So let's talk about actually hiring a salesperson and what that looks like. Um, so I guess maybe why should someone hire a salesperson to begin with? You know, what are, what are those big reasons, which you kind of touched on a little bit, but any other reasons that someone should really be considering this? Yeah. You know, maybe they shouldn't, right? Like timing needs to be right. They need to be, we talked about ready to invest, ready to focus on this side of the business. Um, I've seen shops that have like tried to push and focus on sales and then it starts working and then there's issues with production. So I would say like, let's make sure that the back end of your shop is dialed in humming, good to go. And that you feel like we're ready to now fuel growth and we have capacity and we have the equipment and we have the people th that are, are ready to go do it. Um, if all of that stuff aligns and you now do focus on sales, it can really catapult growth. So the timing is never right. Like when is the right time to add an employee to your shop? Like it's a tough, tough question to answer. Um, but in my opinion, you got, you got to have a lot of stuff in, in place. And again, be ready to focus on it and ready to invest in it. Do you think there is a shop that may think they're too small to do this? You know, a lot of DTF printers have, you know, DTF just in their garage or in their home, or they're even just, you know, buying transfers for someone else and may just be a sure. one two person team. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah. If, if it's a one or two person team, it's a garage shop, a basement shop, um, if you're at capacity, like not a good time to hire. If you've got a bunch of production capacity and you can tap part-time employees to help print, or you can contract out and you want to grow revenue, I don't think there's really a, a 
a time that's too early. But again, you have to be able to invest in this because often we see like a sales rep starts, they're not productive right away. It's going to take some time for them to figure out the market, start to prospect, you know, outbound cold calling, outbound efforts take some time to mature. So you're going to have to invest in this person for some time. Um, I think it's really up to the shop to figure out like, when is that right time to bring on that salesperson? Sure. And then if they've decided, yes, this makes sense for my business, where we're at and where we want to go, what qualities should that business owner look for when hiring a salesperson? Yeah, for me, I'm always looking for their intrinsic motivation. Um, I don't care what industry it is. I've hired quite a few salespeople in, in my career. And what I always focus on and the people that are those top performers always have that intrinsic motivation. They've got that fire inside, the tenacity. They have a specific why of why they really want to perform well and what they want to do. Um, and so I'll ask questions like, what motivates you? And and try to understand the why. Why is that? Tell me more about that. Try to really dig into their motivation. M maybe it's money. A lot of salespeople are money or financially motivated. Great. If they're motivated by money, I want to understand what that means. So why? What does that allow you to then do? Maybe they want material goods. Maybe they want to support their family. So like I'm I'm digging really deep into that motivation. Or I might ask some like behavioral or situational based questions like, tell me a time when or how did you motivate yourself to complete more unpleasant projects or tasks? Like how do you stay motivated when you're doing things that aren't fun? Like cold calling. Cold calling is not fun. Cold calling sucks. Picking up the phone and making 100 calls and getting hung up on 95 times, not, not enjoyable for most people. So what did they do in past instances, in past companies to, to show those behaviors of being motivated to really go and continue to drive and do it? Um, so tenacity, motivation, intrinsic motivation, definitely one. The other thing that I would always look at is prior experience and, and prior success in a related business or related role doesn't mean that they would have to have sold apparel decoration in the past or even know our industry at all, but they better have come from a business like ours. And uh, here's an example. If they worked for really large organizations with heavy marketing budgets and a name recognition and sales enablement materials and all this stuff to help them sell, likelihood of them transitioning to a business like in our industry that doesn't have any of that and they have to go figure it out. Like they, in this industry, salespeople can't have their hand held. They need to go out and do it. That's why I think that motivation is so critical. So I would look at past experience of working with small businesses, high growth businesses that are, they're, they're going out and really having to make things happen and not have to have their hand, hand held ongoing. So I, I would look at those two things more than anything. Right. Yeah. We are finding a lot, even just in this industry, that conversation of, do you need to hire someone who has experience with printing or apparel? And especially with DTF printing in terms of finding someone to use the heat press, um, you don't really need to have a lot of background and that training process can happen pretty quickly. So that low barrier to entry in terms of hiring in that level um, can be pretty easy. Uh, interesting what you're saying about salesperson and gosh, the cold calling. I mean, as a true millennial here, you know, I remember calling people and having to like write down everything I was going to say. So, you know, finding someone who obviously is going to do that from the start, but doesn't have to do it every time. For it's sure. Just, for sure. Nerve wracking well, well. role in and of itself. It's, it's, right. it's challenging. It's hard. And yeah, I, I, there so many people ask, like, do I have to find someone that has industry experience? If you can find them great, but like, where are you going to find that salesperson that, and do they have bad experience and, and you know, bad habits from another shop that they worked with? Mm -hmm. I don't know. I think that's challenging in and of itself. I would much rather find someone that has a proven track record for success in growing sales in similar businesses than hanging my hat on only people from the industry that get, get this business. Right. What are your thoughts on um, their social media presence or their presence, their interest in having presence in the industry? Do you feel as though they need to kind of, you know, be a brand ambassador? Um, what does that look like? for you, what you're looking for hiring, either their interest in that or their background experience in it? Yeah. I, I don't know if I, I put too much weight on it, 
but I would want to make sure that like they've used LinkedIn. I think LinkedIn is a great tool from a prospecting perspective that not a lot of people and shops take advantage of. Mm -hmm. um, we've t tended to lean on Instagram, which I think Instagram can be a great, a great tool, but the people that we're reaching out to on Instagram that manage those Instagram accounts have to be the same person that manages their, their merch or apparel uh, buying, which isn't always aligned. But when I'm reaching out to someone on LinkedIn, they are the person that I'm reaching out to directly. It's not the business's uh, social media account. It's the personal account. Okay. So I might just want to make sure that that person is willing to utilize their LinkedIn profile to help grow and expand their book of business. And salespeople are asked to do this in every business. So if they're not willing to do that, I've just question as to why and try to dig a little bit deeper into that. Yeah. I remember interviewing someone way back in the day, um, who just, we were talking about hiring salespeople and she had made the mistake or she of not really in listening to her gut about a sales rep, um, because sure. they didn't have a LinkedIn account. She was like, I, and it turned out mm. to be an issue, a problematic issue, but she was like, that was my first key. They didn't have a LinkedIn account and they were a sales rep. So that is, yeah. In this day and age, you yep. do have to reach out to people in that way. The photos up, they've got a professional profile. Like that's something easy that you can do. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I wouldn't say it's a end all be all prerequisite, but I think it's a, a good thing, a, a good check mark in the positive yeah. category for that, that candidate. Yeah. And we'll talk about AI and, you know, technology and automation tools later in this, but LinkedIn now has a function that you can use. There's like AI to enhance your, your headshot. So I'm seeing a lot of people on private jets and in rooms that I know that they're never in. So I love it. Interesting. Love it. All right. So, okay. So back to sales marketing, touched a little bit about this. Like how do you align your sales efforts with marketing tactics to maximize that lead generation? Yeah. So not a lot of shops I think have like sh strong marketing tactics or a marketing like uh process built out. Um, it's, it's hard, right? Like you have to, just like sales, you have to put time and effort and knowledge into it. If you understand AdWords and Google and meta ads, and you understand retargeting and you understand uh, content creation and content marketing and social media marketing, great level, level up on it, do it, go like, push that lever. Um, not a lot of people have that. So if you don't have it, you can always invest in an agency or pe a person or a company to help you with that. Um, just like on the sales end, like if you don't have someone within your walls that can manage sales, you got to hire someone or you got to learn how to do it and, and, and go do it. So I, I don't see a lot of shops like focusing on how do I align my sales and marketing and make sure that they're together it's like most shops are like, do I want to focus on sales or do I want to focus on marketing? If you can focus on both, holy grail. Like that's, yes. So and the way that I would see that align is our lead list that we're getting from an outbound perspective, all of those folks should be getting social media marketed. marketed. They should be retargeted. Uh, if they hit our website, we should pixel track them and we should start feeding them content and data. So we should market to them. And then also we should be hitting them with, call to action, specific outbound outreach calls, emails, LinkedIn messages, asking them for a meeting more of like sales outreach, um, sales and marketing do align, but in our industry, I don't, I don't see a lot of companies really from a sophisticated perspective, managing marketing and managing sales and pushing them together. Right. Yeah. Those are a lot of touch points as well. It's not just picking up the phone. It's yeah. Emails. What are you, do you, consider any, um, you know, postal or, you know, like cards that are actually going out in the mail, snail mail it seems so antiquated now, but that, that's, it's, it's that's funny. It, it's fun. It's fun to think about. Yes. So I've seen it work. Um, let's talk a little bit more about like an outbound strategy and what that could look like as part of this. Cause I want to add it in as, as part of that, right. that topic. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, jumped the gun a little bit. We were talking about marketing. So I went right into that, but yeah. So how does, when well, you've got the the salesperson or you were doing that yourself, how are you going to develop that sales strategy? Yeah. So all of this outbound effort, this outbound campaign, this going out and selling should be campaign driven. So there's got to be a process around it. There has to be a campaign. I've seen way too many shops where like, yeah, we tried outbound. I'm like, tell me a little bit more about what you did. It's like, yeah, we called a couple of times or sent a few emails. It didn't work. Like, of course, like it has to be campaign driven, has to be multi-channel, call, email, LinkedIn, text, visit, drop-offs. Like there's a lot of different channels. 
And I find like 10 plus touches, usually about the amount of uh, touches that campaign should be. So there's got to be that process and that structure. Um, and then we got to dial in what's the messaging and the language that we use. How do we really go go out and, and go target? Um, calls work, getting people live and sharing, hey, we're working with other, let's say coffee shops. We're working with other coffee shops in, in our area, in my geography, and we're helping them with retail merchandise solutions and helping them to make more money on the merch that they sell in their shops. I wanted to share how we're doing that and see if we can help you in the same way. So that call strategy of getting people live and asking for time, great. That should be covered with emails. You should be saying that same thing. You know them, their business, and how you can help them. The, I think the coffee shop thing, again, like we help other coffee shops, that should be spelled out in emails as well. Then in LinkedIn, uh, from a mailing perspective, it, interesting here, like should you be sending direct mail? Maybe. Um, what I have seen a couple of businesses do is they'll put together their like core target. Maybe it's only like 10 or 20 where these are like their top prospects and they're in a campaign already. One step of that campaign is they send a piece of certified mail or a FedEx or a UPS envelope with a letter handwritten or typed out, whatever that's similarly saying, Hey, I've reached out to you a ton. I, I think we can help you. We work with a lot of other, other people in the space. There is zero chance that they're going to throw that away. You're never going to get a FedEx envelope or a certified piece of mail that goes in the trash. So you are you are guaranteed that they're going to read that that letter or at least know who it's from. So I don't know if I would put a bunch of stake in like sending a sending a mailer, uh, but it's better than nothing. Like let's try it. You might get some hits on it, uh, but either way, if you're going to go outbound, there has to be this campaign structure. There has to be multi-channel and it has to be multi-touch. Do you have any print shops that you've worked with recently that you could maybe share a success story or even just an example of um, creating this sales strategy? Yeah, I'll talk about um, I'll talk about Kevin Oakley from Stoked On in Las Vegas. Um, he he decided before he was going to recruit and hire salespeople that he was going to figure it out himself, and he was going to understand the tooling and technology, and he was going to understand that campaign driven outbound approach. So. He had the luxury of having a business partner that could handle operations and handle the production and, and the back end of the business. So it allowed Kevin to just go full bore into sales. Um, what I love about what he did is that he just lived it. He figured it out. He did a bunch of research. He did all the work. He and I worked together pretty closely to build a lot of this stuff out, but then he ran with it and he figured it out. And then he hired people and trained them and allowed them to step into that seat and help help really, really go. Um, the one thing that I think helped him do this process well is building campaigns, figuring out his market, his industry, his niche, who he wanted to reach out to, and then just targeting them really, really heavily. Um, it was fun to fun to watch it, watch it work. That's great. Yeah, Kevin and his team at Stoked on Printing are awesome. If you want to learn more about what Kevin is doing in Las Vegas, um, definitely check out his episode of the DTF Printing Podcast. Um, and uh, we're also doing a shop tour. We, we were there um, during Printing United and got a, a tour of his DTF facility. Um, so stay tuned for a shop tour. Um, and Kevin's always, you know, around to answer any questions and be so helpful. So yeah, definitely. Yeah, check he's out. awesome. He's awesome. I was there. I, I took a tour of his facility. It is pretty impressive while, while we were in Vegas for Printing United. Just awesome. Awesome. Yeah. See what he was doing. And he's a great example of, you know, a screen printer who has added DTF um, to his business and, and really been successful with it. And not also, you know, like completely gone away with screen printing. He's, he's doing both. And now he has two different facilities, you know, or two different, you know, facilities within the same area. Um, but yeah, it was, it was very cool to see. So you'll get a behind the scenes tour in a few weeks of that. Love it. Can I share one more example? Um, yes, please. Uh, Davis from B graphics yeah. who has transitioned his whole shop to DTF now. Um, he and I went through a project and we built sales process and we built messaging and we built some outreach strategies. And um, we went through this project. He he pulled me aside at the Apparel Decoration Summit, uh, maybe like eight or nine months after our engagement. And he was like, Kevin, I got good news and bad news. Bad news, I really haven't done anything of the work that we had put together. But the good news is I did do one thing. He did a reactivation campaign. 
So not hold outbound, but he took our campaign strategy and he targeted current customers that maybe hadn't, I think it was hadn't ordered in six months or a year and did like, it was text, text, call, email. He just built out a campaign and mm -hmm. built the language and executed it. And he was like, I put it together for 30 people and I got nine orders within like the first two days of sending texts. So he was like, I don't care now that I didn't roll out anything that we had talked about because I've already gotten the value from it. I've got nine orders that I likely wouldn't have gotten otherwise if I wouldn't have proactively reached out to current customers. So it's just proof that like this works. Outbound works. And I don't care if it's cold net new outbound to people that have never heard about you or uh, current customer outreach and outbound. It's, it, it's a strategy that, we should take advantage of more in our industry. For sure. Yeah. Davis gets a lot of love over here at TTF printing. This is the second webinar we've done where he get, has had a, a shout out, um, but he's Love a great it. example of, of someone who's actually moved, got rid of all of his screen printing equipment and went completely into DTF and, and he's doing a lot. Um, and he is also a guest of the DTF printing podcast. So if you want to learn more, definitely check out that. Episode. <laughs> Love it. Um, yeah, he's paying me under the table to, you know, <laughs> promote his business all the time, right? It's constant. All right, so let's get back into, as well, talking about money, sales commissions. So sometimes, you know, like difficult to talk about, difficult to figure out how should a business owner structure their sales commissions? Yeah, this is a this is a big topic and a big discussion. I'll, I'll scratch the surface here. Uh, there is a lot of intricacies that go into building sales commission, sales comp plan. Um, a couple of best practices that I'll share. Uh, I haven't seen really any shops put together 100% commission compensation plans. So meaning that there should be a salary component, uh, hourly or salary base pay component on top of commission. The only outlier is if we buy someone's business and the owner is trying to like sunset or retire or get out of the business where maybe we're giving them 100% commission on the work that they do after the fact if they're kicking us deals. Hmm. So there should be a base salary or hourly plus commission-based process. You can structure commission in a number of different ways. Um, the approach that I like to take is off of revenue. I, I think paying... Off of revenue is easy. It's not complicated. They're getting a percent of the revenue that they bring in. Some shops do it off of margin, off of uh, profit. If mm -hmm. you have a way, I would say the only way that I would do that is if I have a really easy way of taking out cost of goods sold. If I can show them and I can calculate it really, really easily, maybe you want to um, look at margin or profit versus revenue. Revenue is just so much cleaner. It's so much easier. And they don't have to do a lot of math to figure it out because I want that salesperson, if they close a deal, I want them to know exactly the amount of money that they're going to make. I want them to know the dollars. So I want them to know how much their commission check is going to be next month and not have to get deep into it. Um, I, I've seen a lot of shops just say, yep, we pay, let's, I'm throwing out this number. It's not that it's the right number for everyone. Let's say they pay 5% of revenue. So 5% of revenue is their commission. And I see too many shops just throwing out that flat number, which means they could sell $1,000 worth of apparel, or they could sell $100,000 worth of apparel, and they still get 5% no matter what. The, the one thing that I would do is create a quota, create a goal. What should they sell each month? And this is going to have to grow over time. They're not going to sell that amount day one, month one. Uh, but as they ramp, what does that look like? And then when they're ramped in the role, what should that amount be? For some shops, it's they want them to bring in 50K, you know, 600,000 of revenue. S some it's 20K, 240,000 of revenue. Some it's even more. I've seen shops bring in easily seven figures as their role in, in the shop. So you have to figure out and do that math of what you would want that person to do and then figure out, all right, how much commission would that, would that be if we break down that, that percent basis? The other thing that I'll say on commission is accelerators work. So what I mean by this is, let's say we give them a 50,000 monthly quota. They need to sell $50,000 of, of decoration every month. Um, if they sell above that, if they sell 60,000, they get an accelerator. So instead of maybe 5%, 
they're now getting 6% from dollar one of what they sold. What we're trying to do here is continue to motivate them and get them excited to keep selling and not hit their quota the 20th day of the month and not do anything for the next 10 days. They're, they're always pushing and trying to sell more and we're motivating them to continue to sell. Um, maybe decelerators too. I don't love this, but if their quote is 50 grand and they only sell $20,000 that month and they're already ramped, maybe they're not getting 5% commission. Maybe they're getting four or three, right? I, I don't want to discourage them, but I want to make sure that like they're consistently hitting their, their numbers. The other thing to keep in mind is our, um, our industry and our businesses are cyclical and seasonal. So that January and February quota might be different than that November quota or summer quota, right? When we're much, much more busy um, and really ripping as a shop. Um, I'll share one more tidbit. I find a lot of shops commissioning their customer service or account managers, which I'm okay with that. But keep in mind, they're not salespeople. They're order takers or they're managing customer relationships. Are they getting quotes approved and closing business and bringing in revenue? Yes, but it's people that are already coming to them. Way, way different and way easier than me going out, finding someone that's never bought from us, doesn't know who we are and bringing them in. In my opinion, that person that's doing that hard outbound work to bring them in uh should be way more heavily compensated from a commission percentage, just like percentage uh, factor than what someone that's just taking inbound orders in should be. Um, and then also there's a question of if the salesperson is only focused on closing net new business and they close one, they pass the relationship off to the account manager, go get the next customer. Do they get more revenue or more commissions from that customer as they continue to order? I think there should be a nine month or 12 month runway that every order that that customer gets that they brought in, even though they're not managing that ongoing, they're still getting a piece of that uh, ongoing. So again, there's so many different in intricacies to commission plans, but hopefully some of those little best practices and nuggets will help if people are in that process of thinking about how they commission salespeople. Yeah, it definitely sounds like it. And then it also seems kind of a recurring word I'm hearing is motivation. And you're trying to find that within the hiring process. And then you're also trying to find that in terms of continuing to have them selling throughout the month, despite whatever structure you've created. For sure. Yeah. Okay. Yep. So, so what strategies have some of your clients implemented to create a more predictable and uh, stable revenue stream? So a couple, um, strategies. I think current current customer outreach, like the Davis example, um, it, it's funny when I go through this process of helping a shop to develop their outbound strategy, they'll often come back to me and say, we want to start this and like tiptoe into this by going outbound to our current customers. Mm -hmm. I think that strategy can help drive more predictable and more consistent revenue. We've done all that hard work. We've brought them on as a client. Why not go outbound and try to target them more effectively? And this could be, you know, uh, a targeted campaign around people that haven't ordered hard goods or, or something outside of what they've already ordered. Hey, we noticed that you haven't ordered this. Do you know that we do tote bags or, you know, whatever, whatever that is. It could even be, we noticed that you haven't ordered from us in over a year, or we noticed that you ordered 10 months ago. Are you going to be reordering that? Like that proactive outreach, I think is, is super, super, uh, beneficial, um, Strategies to make sure that it's it's implemented effectively and like trying to drive more revenue. I would say like someone owns it. It can be the owner, it can be a salesperson, but there has to be someone that owns sales and owns outbound and that owns that revenue stream, that predictable like top of funnel revenue stream. Um, another strategy that I, I think we don't put enough stake in as an industry is uh, referrals. So most shops have done a lot to try to like beef up their uh, Google review, uh, uh, Google reviews overall. Uh, that's important. And yes, you should do that. But also like what, if I'm asking a customer for something, why don't I ask them for more revenue? <laughs> and if I ask for a referral and say, Hey, do you know anyone else in your industry that's in a similar position to you? Like, I want to be specific with this ask. 
that could benefit from the work that we do and could help them as well, would, would you mind making a quick email introduction to that person? And I'll even make it easy. I'll send the text. All you have to do is copy and paste it, put us both on an email and send it. Do you mind doing that for me? Like making that referral ask? Um, I know a lot of times we're asking about reviews in the box or in an email after. Uh, again, great. You should do that. But let's ask those current customers, especially in the honeymoon phase of that order, when they get sh shirt in hand and they're like, this is awesome. And they're super happy. Like strike while the iron's hot, make, make the ask then ask them about what they, what they think about it. And if they'd be willing to make some connections for us. Um, one more boxing and kidding. Um, in my sales membership cohort, we've had a bunch of people share on box and kidding strategies and how that's driven a more predictable revenue stream back to their shop. I haven't heard anyone do it yet that regrets it and said it wasn't fruitful. Um, it, it, I mean, it, just think about it. Like I'm taking the time and effort to go out, send a curated box to someone that has all this great merch in it. And um, I see more people now putting their prospects logos on that merch versus their shop logo. Shop logo is better than nothing. Um, and now we can like get, uh, vector and get that image and tr transfer it to their, like we, you can print it, like just do it. I've seen some, some shops do 20 or 30 bucks a box. I've seen other shops do $150 a box and still pay off. Um, two things typically come out of it. One, they'll order something that's in the box that they either didn't know you did, or they really like and enjoy or two. They're like, hey, do you do these kidding in boxes? Can we order this for our clients or for our team or for our employees? So they're getting uh, boxing and kidding orders from it as well. Um, yeah, just another strategy to like lean on to drive revenue, have it be more predictable. Yep. And DTF printing is an awesome option easy. for that. It's easy. Why not? Um, you can even, you know, DTF the box, you know, uh, slap a label on the box, slap um, a design on the box. Yeah. I think that people love free stuff anyway. And then if it's stuff that they didn't even know existed, I think that's always a great option. You know, keep pushing them what you have, what you think they'll like, what's trending, show it to them and show them in a way that it's like, um, I think I was talking to Bella Canvas this was a couple of years ago. They gave a tour and we had two other print shops with us and they were like, yeah, like loving the seasonal boxes that were coming. And they were just having the conversation of the different logos and the different applications and um, having the idea of like, oh, I can do this myself. So okay. it's really starting that conversation and then obviously being that person that they can go back to. Love that. Yeah. Um, okay. Let's talk about automation, all the technology that is out there can maybe feel a little bit daunting or overwhelming. Um, in my opinion, it's here. So you better find a way to use it and also kind of, you know, why not? So how can DTF printers um, use this to their advantage? What are some tools that you can recommend? Yeah, there's a few different technology tools that are, I think, absolutely needed in order for a shop to go outbound. Um, I'll talk about three. CRM is one. Uh, lead generation tools is two, and then email automation is three. Uh, C CRM, two main reasons why you need one. One, to keep track and organized of all of your leads. All those people, all the contacts that you're reaching out to, you, you need a place to organize them and keep activity history. All of the emails, all the calls, you need to stay organized with that outreach. Uh, the second reason for CRM is to manage your opportunity flow, your deal flow. Most print shop management softwares take over after the deal is closed to like ma manage the um, the scheduling of that job. What, what I want to look at is I just reached out to them. I got a meeting scheduled. I'm doing an analysis and a discovery. I'm now presenting solutions. I'm trying to close the business. That whole flow of like the sales process and the stages that we go through, CRMs organize all of that. So at any time I can log in and I can see all of the people that I have open opportunities with and try to push them through the sales process. So a CRM is just a, a technology tool to manage all of those things. Uh, lead gen. It looked like Brandon Harrington asked a question. Where would the salesperson find these potential prospects at? In your experience, where are these customers usually coming from? So that's what a lead generation software does. Um, it allows you to get contact information. So in these lead gen tools, um, I've seen shops use Uplead, Lead411, Seamless. There's a lot of different 
uh, different lead gen tools. What you do is you plug in construction trades, you plug in the industry, you plug in the geography, you plug in the size by employees or by revenue. Uh, and then you plug in the roles and titles or the, the seniority of people that you want to target. So now I can get a list of presidents of construction companies in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, that are 20 employees and above. And I have this curated list with first name, last name, email address, phone number, uh, 30% of the time about we'll get cell phone data even. So now I can implement text into my outbound campaigns. So there are a lot of tools that will allow us to get those leads. Now I pull those leads into my CRM and I start to run these campaigns. Some CRMs have email automation built in. Um, others, you'll have to use an outside tool. A lot of us are probably familiar with like drip marketing tools like MailChimp or Constant Contact. That's an email automation tool. So um, CRMs like HubSpot have email automation built in. There's others that are smaller that don't have really great email automation where you might have to use, let's say a pipe drive or a Monday or a nutshell or close. And you might also use an outside MailChimp, Clenty, Woodpecker, Constant Contact and have those, those tools sync and talk to one another. Um, so again, there's a lot in this topic. Um, there was a question I saw, a pre-question about like AI and how how DTF shops should use AI to sell. I, th I think like there's, there's too much basic rudimentary stuff to like, don't worry about AI. And I've seen some shops create like email campaigns um, and email marketing uh, using AI and using chat GPT to create emails. And it's a 12 paragraph email that no one's ever going to read. That's not personalized enough. So right. I would much rather focus on, um, on trying to build like the basics, the basics here. Uh, it looked like Patrick raised his hand. I'm going to allow him, allow him in here. Patrick, do yeah. you want to rip a question here? Uh, you just got to unmute if you want to ask. Sorry, that was, that was an accident. I'm sorry. Oh, good. Oh, okay. No worries. Oh, an accident. <laughs> okay. Well, hey, Patrick, how are you? <laughs> Hello. All right. Well, we can get into um, some of the questions in the chat and then questions that were sent ahead of time. Um, We've already answered a lot of your questions that you, that you sent in in registration, but here's one from Meryl Catlin with Make a Tea Online. Shout out to Meryl. You can also listen to her episode of the DTF Printing Podcast. Um, she asked, what would be your simplest way to explain or justify the cost of DTF printing to the client who is used to screen printing costs? Great question. Okay. Um, I would bet that the vast majority of your customers don't know the difference between screen and DTF and don't care. They want decoration on something. <laughs> they want print on something. I don't think we need to explain the differences and I don't think we need to explain the prices even. We're the experts, we understand. We know the best application of the work that we do. We should understand their needs, why they want it, what they're looking for, and we should make a recommendation as to what that is. If you start getting into the differences of printing and the differences of pricing as to why screen is this way and DTF is this way, I, I think it's just way too complicated. Um, if you present something that's different price than what they, they've seen otherwise, maybe they'll ask that question and you can communicate, this is the best application of how I see you printing this material. And based on what you told me was important in this order, quality, you want this to be their favorite shirt, you want it to last, like whatever that was, I would say, this is the printing this is the the proposal, my recommendation at how we should go forward with this. I don't think there should be a discrepancy between between the two. Okay, interesting. All right, Leah here asked, I often get stuck on building the process versus doing the thing. Do you have any advice on building the rocket ship mid-launch or however that saying goes, <laughs> or otherwise balancing documentation and doing? Yeah, uh, good question. I think it's okay to build the rocket ship mid-launch. Like try, see what works. This doesn't have to be perfect. I've had a lot of shops that are like, we don't want to burn our leads. Like if you have a bad email or you get someone live on the phone and you have not the best conversation, the likelihood of them remembering you and what you said is zero. So just do it. Like, yes, you should not get stuck in the minutia and just focus on building the process. Leah, you got to go out and try it. You got to go do it. Um, and the beautiful part about this is outbound works, cold calling works you're going to see some success. The better it is, the more pointed, the more personalized, and the more quality of your outreach, the more conversions you're going to get. 
but you have to match that quality with high quantity. This is a numbers game. This has to be a machine in a funnel. And you got to get to that point where you get hundreds of new leads into campaigns and sequences every week. And now you're hitting hundreds, if not thousands of people on a monthly basis. Yeah. Great answer. Uh, and then John asks, what ideas would you suggest for second, third, fourth touches for trying to warm up a cold process prospect? He's done some generic postcards, which has had some initial success, just trying to figure out other ways, what messaging should be to make them more aware of what we offer. He'd love to get them to kid get them kidding, but what are the lead items to get them invested and eager to learn more? Sure, sure. So I think your your second, third, fourth touches should be combined with your fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth touches. So you should have a 10 touch campaign. And it's okay if those touches are maybe it's a LinkedIn connection request and then call, email, call, email. Like you should continue to go and you're saying similar things in each of those touches. Um, I, I kind of follow this mantra, show me, you know me. When I'm reaching out to someone cold, they should show me that they know who I am. They know me, my business, and the problems or challenges that I face. So if I am reaching out to construction companies, I'm talking to them about how we're helping other construction companies in the area, or I'm talking to them about how we're helping provide seamlessness of, of workwear ordering, or I'm helping them put details around how their shirts need to be durable and long lasting and cover their crews with shirts that have SPF or whatever, right? I'm just diving into all these specific things about their industry. Um, so your, your messaging and language can say really, really similar things in all steps of the sales process, but it's got to scream personalized for me. John is sending this email to Kevin because Kevin has this need because he's in this industry and orders these types of things. Um, it shouldn't be, hey, we do DTF and, and screen and embroidery and hey, we do shirts. Do you want 999 hats? Like that, that's not the outreach that I'm talking about. The outreach I'm talking about is putting personalized communication and targeting them and showing them how we can help help them. Yeah, and there are so many ways to do that, having that personalization touch. I think you already answered Brandon's original question about you know where to find these potential prospects, yeah. but he has asked a question that will lead in exactly to what we were about to do. Um, so Brandon asked, are these tools covered in your $2,500 course in depth? Um, Kevin, do you wanna talk a little bit about the Sales Inc. Academy subscription um, while I get the raffle winner? Yeah, I'll do that. That was a great tee up, Brandon. We didn't, <laughs> that wasn't planned at all. So thank, thank you for doing that. Um, so the work that I've typically done in the industry is one-on-one -on -one coaching and consulting. I'll get with a shop and we'll develop their sales process and build out messaging and build out outreach strategies. Um, that has a higher price point, the the one-to-one -one component. So I wanted to help smaller shops that might not be able to afford a coach and a consultant to come in and work with them. So I created the Sales Inc. Academy. So what it is, is it's video and downloadable based coursework that talks about all of the things that we talked about today. There's three main sections, sales process, messaging, scripting, and language, and then outreach strategies. So I take the majority of the things that I do on my one-on-one -on -one coaching and consulting, and I packaged it into this, this coursework, this video work. So you watch videos of me talking through it and you get downloadable content. So to answer your question, Brandon, yes the tools and the technology like CRM, like lead gen, like uh, uh, email automation, all those are covered in, in that course in depth. Perfect. And okay. so, what, so what we're going to do is we're going to give away a membership. It's a full membership. Uh, it's that, that course is $2,500. So Adrian's going to use this crazy spin tool to pick someone live here. Let's see who our winner is. Oh, okay. Eric Parnell. Congratulations. Congrats, Eric. Great. All right, Eric. Um, Kevin will reach out to you shortly with information. So congratulations. That is awesome. Thanks, Kevin, for doing that. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. We had one more question come through um, from Brian, if you have time to answer it. Um, how would you go about growing vertically with an existing customer? Ooh, um, by, by vertically, I'm assuming just like driving more revenue or maybe selling other products too. Um, yeah, I, I would try to figure out what they haven't ordered. Communicate to them about, hey, our other customers in, in your space, in your market are taking advantage of some other printed goods and materials. And here, here's some suggestions that I have at how we could help. Um, 
yeah, keep them involved, try to develop the relationship, proactively reach out. Um, you know, th those little touch points can, can help a ton. If they're a large customer, I haven't seen a lot of shops do this, but I think they can be really beneficial. Uh, running like a quarterly uh, par partnership or a quarterly business review. Like if they're a big client, it probably warrants us to spend a little bit of time each quarter talking about the last quarter, what went well, and the new quarter that's coming up and how we might be able to help them. Um, and then just talk about the partnership and the relationship. We talk to our largest clients a lot, right? Like, but we're always talking to them about the order that we're doing right now. I, I like these quarterly partnership reviews because it gives us an opportunity to talk about more than that and get deeper and talk about the partnership as a whole. So yeah, ho hope that answered it, but there's a lot yeah. that we can do within our current customers to really grow. grow. Revenue. I remember you talking about that at the first shirt lab. I think I met you at, you know, in Chicago, uh, that was your entire session. And yeah, speaking of sessions, uh, Kevin will be speaking at DTF Expo 2025 next year. So make sure you um, look out for registration. Attendee registration uh, will open up very soon and you'll be able to see Kevin speak in person um, in even more depth of what we talked about today. Um, but yeah, so thank you everyone who, who joined the webinar today. Congratulations again to Eric Carnell for winning the Sales uh, Inc. Academy subscription. Um, a reminder that the full webinar will be available at dtfprinting.com. So make sure you're registered um, or subscribe to our newsletter and check out our website so you can watch this if you missed it and want to share it with your team and other people in the industry. Um, dtfprinting.com is a great resource for you. Kevin has written an article there on hiring your first salesperson. So make sure you check that out. Again, um, head to dtfexpo.com uh, as well to um get information on attendance registration. Uh, Kevin, anything you want to say about Sales Inc. Academy before we wrap this up? The only thing that I want to say is like, if anyone wants to dive deeper into any of these topics, um, I, I love talking about this stuff and I, I love getting the opportunity to chat more. If you've got questions on Sales Inc. Academy or just want to dive deeper into one of these topics, you can reach me at uh, kevin at sales.ink. So Kevin at sales.inK, don't hesitate to reach out. Happy to help. Perfect. Well, thank you, Kevin. Um, so much here. Uh, learned a lot. And your passion um, to helping people in the industry is so awesome. And we appreciate you. And we're glad you're glad you're part of the this awesome print industry. Um, and yeah, if anyone has any questions, feel free to reach out to Kevin, head to dtfprinting.com. I mentioned the podcast a few times here. Um, and we talked about a lot of different DTF printers who are using Kevin's ideas and services. So um, head over to dtfprinting.com or DTF Printing Podcast to learn more. And um, yeah, we'll see you hopefully at DTF Expo 2025.